Well, good morning, church. My name is Tim Power. I'm one of the pastors here at Salem, and uh, I just want to welcome you to worship. Thank you for worshiping with us. Uh, also, I want to welcome those who are joining us online. It is awesome to be worshiping alongside you as well. Um, who here had a good Thanksgiving? Good. Who here is still eating pie every morning for breakfast? Pumpkin this morning, yeah. Um, here's a very big question, maybe the most important question. Who started listening to Christmas music? A lot of people, a lot of people. So um, we certainly have at my house. Uh, so my oldest son, who's, who's 14, you know what he keeps doing in the morning? He'll come down and he'll say, Alexa, play All I Want for Christmas is You by Mariah Carey. <laughs> he could just say, Alexa, take away my father's will to live. Okay, has anybody started watching Christmas movies yet? So I'm curious. So, so with my wife and kids, we're, we, we have a bunch that we have to get through. We have to get through, or it's not Christmas, really. Um, what are some holiday classics you have to watch each Christmas? Grinch. Which, which Grinch? This, the original cartoon. Jim, Jim Carrey. Elf. Charlie Brown. It's a Wonderful Life. Christmas Story. 34th Street and 43rd Street. Yeah. Muppet Christmas Carol. That's a good one. Guys, this is, this is all we're doing today. I don't have anything ready, so settle in. <laughs> so um, one of my favorites, somebody mentioned, was Charlie Brown Christmas. Um, in fact, when, when I was a kid, my mom said that when we recorded it off of uh, a TV, remember when you did that? You had a VCR and you actually recorded off the TV. Um, so we, we did that, and my mom said I would watch it over and over again, all year round. It could be the middle of the summer, I'd be watching Charlie Brown Christmas. And one of my favorite things about Charlie Brown Christmas is the tree. Do you remember the tree? So um, Charlie Brown, they're, they're making a, a school pageant, I think it is, like, like a pageant for Christmas. And you know, nobody wants to give him big responsibility because nobody trusts Charlie Brown. So they give him one job, and that's to get a good tree for Christmas that they could use for their pageant. And what does he do? Charlie Brown goes out, and he, instead of picking the biggest, fullest, most majestic tree, he finds the smallest, the weakest, the scrawniest, the ugliest Christmas tree around. It's a Christmas tree that gave up on being picked for Christmas. It is terrible. And this is the one that Charlie Brown picks. And it makes no sense, but it really kind of captures the essence of the Christian Christmas story, that God uses the most unexpected, the most unqualified, and the people in the most humble circumstances to bring about his plan. And, and I want you to know that God does have a plan. And God has a plan for you. God has a plan for me. God has a plan for his people. And he wants you to be a part of his plan. And this is a good season for us to jump on board what God has for his people. So the story that Pastor Deb read out of Luke is another perfect example of this. God using the least likely people, in this case, Zechariah and his wife, Elizabeth, to prepare the way for the coming of Jesus. I want to give a little bit of context about this scripture. It comes out of the Gospel of Luke. Now, we have four Gospels in our New Testament. We have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, three of those Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are what we call the Synoptic Gospels. The Synoptic Gospels, that means that they have a lot of similarities. They tell a lot of the same stories. Now, uh, New Testament scholars believe that Mark was written first and that Matthew and Luke probably used Mark kind of as a basis to shape their stories. It was kind of a template because everything that happens in Mark is in the other Gospels, the other Synoptic Gospels. So 
John, on the other hand, was written probably later than those Gospels and has a very different purpose. John, if you read it, it doesn't have a Christmas story like any of the others. Um, and it's, it's kind of more a spiritual biography of Jesus. So whereas the other ones are more nuts and bolts, uh, this is what Jesus did, this is what Jesus said... The Gospel of John is really concerned with who Jesus is spiritually, that he is the Word of God, or as the Greek puts it, that he is the Logos of God, that he was with God from the beginning, he is God, and yet he's also come from God as a man, as our Savior. Now, Luke, that's what we read out of today, is a really unique perspective in the Gospels. It's said to have been written by a physician, Luke, who was a follower of Jesus, though not one of the 12 apostles that we think about as following Jesus. Luke comes at his task of telling Jesus' story with the skeptic in mind. Do we have any skeptics? I, I, I tend to be skeptical myself. It's not a bad thing. I, I, think, I think God can handle our questions. God can handle us asking hard questions even. So, so Luke comes with a skeptic in mind. Um, and when Luke's writing, he's writing to folks um, that have a very specific perspective, and so he wants, to, he wants to let everybody know, I've done the work, I've put in the work to know that the things I'm writing are true. Uh, in fact, he starts Luke by, he starts the gospel this way, and I'm going to read the first four verses. Many people have already applied themselves to the task of compiling an account of the events that have been fulfilled among us. They used what the original eyewitnesses, so he's talking about eyewit people who have actually seen it, and servants of the word handed down to us. Now, after having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, I have also decided to write a carefully ordered account for you. Most honorable Theophilus. So Theophilus is the person he actually wrote the gospel for. I want you to have confidence in the soundness of the instruction you have received. Now, according to New Testament scholar N.T. Wright, at this time in first century Palestine, each community had its own storyteller, okay? So these were people recognized by a community as those who curated the oral history of all of the events that happened amongst a people group. So at the time, oral histories of storytellers were considered more reliable than the written word. Isn't that interesting? It was considered more reliable what these storytellers had memorized than the written word. And this wasn't just true about the Jewish people. In fact, uh, philosopher, the philosopher Plato argued that the spoken word would always be superior and more trustworthy than the written word. Now, how do we know he said that? Because somebody wrote it down. But still, Luke was being very thorough in his gospel by finding people who were good, reliable sources. He spoke to the storytellers in the community so that he knew that he was finding trustworthy people that had firsthand accounts so Luke, I want you to always remember that. It's the gospel for skeptics. Now, one thing I think is important if we're, we're looking at the Christmas story is to understand where the people who experienced it firsthand were. Now, the Jewish people at this time were living under Roman occupation. They lived day to day as an oppressed and a marginalized people. So I want you to think about how being in a pressed, marginalized person would shape the way you pray, how it would shape the way that you worship. If, if our nation was under occupation from a foreign power, how would you pray every day? First thing you woke up in, in, in the morning and before you went to sleep at night, how would that affect your prayers? How would that affect when we would come together and worship? Would we be asking for God, God for different things than if everything was going well? Probably, right? So that's the world into which we meet this priest, Zechariah. He probably served a small worshiping community closer to his home where he lived with his wife, Elizabeth. So I want you to think of him more kind of like as a small town pastor who gets an opportunity. It says it was, it was by lottery that he was able to go work in the Holy of Holies. Now, this was, this was um, something that would happen maybe just once in his lifetime, was that he could go into the holiest parts of the temple in Jerusalem. 
a place where no one else could go except a priest who was appointed there for this period of time. So he goes into the Holy of Holies and he encounters an angel. And the angel tells him that he and his wife are going to be having a baby, that this baby was going to be John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist is going to act as a prophet to prepare the way for the ministry of Jesus, to prepare the way so that, so that he could prepare the ground for what Jesus was going to accomplish with his earthly ministry. Now, I think this is kind of funny. Zechariah, he's in the holiest place for, for Jewish people. He's in the Holy of Holies in the temple. He's approached by an angel of God. That's all pretty crazy, pretty impossible, right? Pretty miraculous. And then when he hears that his wife is going to become pregnant, he says, nope. No, that can't happen. That can't happen. Why did he say this? Why would he say this? Well, we are told that he is old and that his wife, Elizabeth, is old. They're way past childbearing years. Now, by the way, to this Jewish audience, this, this story would probably remind them of a story from the Old Testament. Do you know what story that would be? Abraham, yeah. So it would remind them of the story of Abraham and Sarah. So in the story of Abraham and Sarah, uh, way back in the book of Genesis, they were too old to have a child, but they were promised a child of, from God, that they would actually have a child who would start the nation of Israel. It was so out there as an idea that Sarah, who was old as well, laughed at God. That's kind of a no-no back then. She laughed at God. But you know what? They did have a baby. And that baby was the beginning of this nation of Israel. Now, when I read this story about Zechariah and I read about his response, I try to put myself in his shoes. Have you ever tried to do that? When, when you read a passage of Scripture, you try to put yourself in that person's shoes. Well, we know that he's advanced in years, and so is his wife, that they live in a culture in which your legacy, okay, your legacy is judged by the number of children you have. And they don't have any. In fact, in their culture, children would have been a sign that God is blessing. Hey, you want to come up and preach? <laughs> Children are a sign of God's blessing on your life at this time. So if you didn't have children, I'll bet there was probably a lot of gossip. I'll bet there was probably a lot of gossip. What do you think Zechariah did? Well, how did he mess up so bad that he can't have kids? What do you think he did? Or maybe it's his wife, Elizabeth. Maybe she sinned. I wonder what they did, and probably people just talked behind their back all the time. And so I'm guessing that at this point, Zechariah had given up on the dream. Now, you don't have to raise your hand right at, at this question, but has anybody here given up on a dream? Has anybody here given up on a dream? Maybe something that burned bright at one point, but now it just seems out of reach. So you just gave up. That's, I think, where Zechariah is. He's given up. In fact, he's given up so much that now he's in the Holy of Holies with an angel of God speaking directly to him. And he says, no, that'll never happen. See, Zechariah has given up on good news. Have you given up on good news? You know, in Christianity, we call the story of Jesus his whole story, okay? Not just his birth, but his birth, his life, his ministry, his death on the cross, his resurrection. We call all of that the gospel. And do you know what the word gospel means? Good news. Good news. And, and why is it good news? It's good news because when we let Jesus' story, when we let Jesus' story connect with our story, it changes everything. And here's, here's a really important truth. Good news changes everything. Good news changes everything. You know, Jesus even changed the definition of what good news is. So remember I told you earlier, when our Savior Jesus was born into the world, people were praying 
for a Messiah. They were praying for a Messiah, but, but what they thought the good news would be is if a, a person came who brought political revolution, that would be good news. But Jesus didn't come for that. He did not come to put the Jewish people at the top of the dog-eat-dog food chain. He came with a revolution of love. A revolution of love. He said, no, in my kingdom, it's going to be different. It's not about being first. Because in my kingdom, the first will be last, and the last are going to be first. It's not about crushing your enemies. No, in my kingdom, you'll love your enemies with such radical, transformational love that it's going to shake the very foundations of the systems of oppression. See, Jesus came, and he brought a revolution of love. See, that love is the good news, and the good news changes everything. It changes everything. So over the next few weeks, we're going to talk more and more about how God's amazing love came into the world in human form. But I want to propose something today, and, and, and I want to lead you in a moment. We're going to lead into a, a quick time of prayer. We all have our own ideas uh, about what good news looks like, right? So for Zechariah and Elizabeth, their idea of good news probably would have been a house full of babies when they're in their 20s, right? But that's not what they got. And so it, it kind of probably seemed like God let them down. And for the Hebrew people in first century Palestine, good news probably would have looked like a Messiah who rose up and overthrew Roman occupation that made the Jewish people a mighty and dominant military force. That would have been good news for them. And that's not what happened. And yet, and yet... Jesus still brought good news. In fact, Jesus brought better news than anyone ever could have expected. In fact, here's the great news, is that we get to be a part of the good news that Jesus brought right now. It hasn't even fully been realized till this day. There is greater love to be shared that you can be a part of. There's greater acts of extravagant generosity that God is calling us to be a part of. So in a moment, I, I, I want to have a moment of prayer that I'm going to invite you to be a part of. And I'm going to pray that God would do two things for us as we're kind of kicking off Advent, as we're, as we're moving towards this celebration of, of what happened when Jesus came into the world. If we've given up on good news through life disappointment or feeling like God let us down, I'm going to pray that God would reawaken our capacity to receive good news. And second, I'm going to pray that God could widen our vision of what good news looks like, that God would widen our view. Maybe it's so much more glorious than we've ever considered before, but it's different. So, so I'm a locally licensed pastor uh, in the United Methodist Church, and uh, I get together sometimes with other locally licensed pastors, and, and we kind of talk about what's going on in our ministries, and we talk about um, kind of the wins and, and the things that we, we would love to, you know, get prayer for. And I was gathered with some, some other pastors a little while back, and one of my friends, Shane, who's a pastor, was there, and we were going around a table and talking about... What, what has God done in, in your church? What are the big things that God's doing in your congregation? And uh, so some folks were like, well, this is the number of the people we had at our Easter service. And everybody's like, well, that's great. That's awesome. Oh, well, here's the number of kids that we had in our VBS. Well, that's great. And, and uh, they get to Shane, and, and, and they say, what's the biggest thing that God's done? He said, well, the best thing that I think has happened this year at our church is that on Wednesday night at the AA meeting, a guy who had been drinking himself to death for decades got on his knees and he said the third step prayer. He said, God, I offer myself to you 
to build with me and do with me as you will. And he's been sober ever since. A life surrendered to God. That sounds like good news. Now, now that's not a bright sanctuary blaring the hallelujah chorus, but maybe good news happens in messy church basements. Maybe good news happens when a cold child gets a coat. I want to say a prayer, and I want you to invite God to show you what good news might look like, how you could receive it this year, and how you could be a part of giving it. So if you would pray with me now. Lord God, I come to you today, and we all come to you today because it's easy to give up on good news. It's easy to get disappointed and, and think that you're not going to come through. But Lord, we know that you are true to your promises. And as we reflect on, as we anticipate what it means that you came into this world in flesh, not to bring the good news that we were expecting, but to bring something all more glorious than we ever could have expected. I pray that you would give us the capacity to receive good news in this season. I also pray, God, that you would open our eyes to what good news could look like. Maybe it's totally unexpected. Maybe it looks nothing like we would have asked for. Lord, we want to be part of your good news. We want to be a part of your revolution of love. That you came and you gave your life up. You died for us so that we could know what real love is and that we could live in light of that love. So God, move upon our hearts by the power of your spirit. Change our hearts. Give us vision of what good news can look like. And help us, Lord. Give us the will, the desire, the boldness to be a part of your changing the world right now. Let us be a part of your revolution of love today, God. We pray this in your holy name. Amen.